All right. Welcome, residents of the Chulu Korik, you ensconced shamans in there. This is Stephen. Uh, thank you for choosing Phantology for this review of The Burning God. And today I have Ben on with me. Ben, how's it going? It's going good. How are you, Stephen? Not bad. And we should also mention that we have two esteemed guests, our friends from the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast, Charles and Dylan, paid us the honor of uh, returning the favor and coming on our show for this one. Uh, the honor is all ours, Stephen. Really excited to be here. Yeah, yeah and if you, we're pumped. If we're pumped you, to talk some Burning God. <laughs> And if you want more reviews, then you guys have reviewed this book as well in your podcast, right? That is correct. We have read all of the Poppy War trilogy. So if you read The Burning God, definitely listen to this episode. Check out some other Phantology stuff. Interact with them on social media. And then come over and listen to our episode after right. that. Once you've listened to every single Phantology episode, then you can come on over and try one of ours if you haven't yet. But yeah. Very, very polite of you guys. <laughs> we try. I, I do. Yeah, I, I do know that you reviewed this uh, about three months ago. You were much more on top of it than we were with this one, much closer to release date. So props for that. You probably got a little bit of a, a bump and listens, I'm guessing. We were way too consumed with Rhythm of War back then. So that we uh, fell behind on a lot of these. Yeah. The Rhythm of War is no small undertaking. So I understand that completely. <laughs> And we went way overboard on that, but now we're rolling into 2021, so we're trying to catch up on some of these other things. Anyway, thanks so much for being on our show. Go ahead and tell listeners uh, how they can find you guys, how they can interact with you. Sure. So we're Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. Uh, Dylan and I, two lifelong friends, love to talk fantasy. You can find us uh, over on Twitter at the FTF Podcast with a number one at the end, so definitely go check us out there. And... Yeah, we're wherever you can listen to podcasts at Friends Talking Fantasy. So if you like fantasy and you like fantasy and you still have appetite for more, come check us out. <laughs> yeah, plug for your Twitter. Dylan does a great job on Twitter. Lots of entertaining <laughs> oh. content there. You're, you're going to get some good GIF reactions. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I didn't know you were a GIF guy, Steven. I, I would say GIF. Uh-oh. Uh, I, think it, I, think I know that's not correct. We would, well, I don't know. I think GIF is correct, right? That's the, that's how the, the creator says creator. GIF. Oh, the creator says yeah, GIF. Yeah, he's well, wrong, though. <laughs> he's wrong. I'd like to be on the side I, of the creator. Creator sounds like a powerful does, figure. I mean, do you say graphical? Because <laughs> isn't, isn't that what it stands no, for? Not, what was not, this, not this debate. Wait, what, is, what does it stand for? <laughs> Graphic. Stands yeah, for uh, graphical something something. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's <laughs> GIF or GIF, whatever. All right. right. Let, let's, let's get to uh, what we're actually talking about here. So, uh, so the conclusion of the Poppy War, right? Book three. Hopefully you've read the previous two books if you're listening to this episode, this will be spoilerific. So this was a book that I just barely finished as of today. I did a marathon read of the last 200 pages or so. I had the day off work, so took advantage of that. I know you guys read it a little bit ago. Ben, you finished, I think, earlier in the week. So we all, we've all finished in time. And uh, what about uh, what about the whole bucket of tears thing, I guess, is, is maybe I was going to say, start. Stephen, so, you just said you you just finished it, but your eyes look pretty clear, you know? They're not puffy. Yeah, they're not red. Yeah, it's all the makeup. Is there a makeup yeah. artist for Phantology? <laughs> you know, gets you prepped. Because I'm sure you have a bucket full of tears somewhere, right? This is going on YouTube, so uh, yeah, we do have our makeup artist. Uh, yeah, my, my bucket full of tears, I guess, is evaporating in the in the next room. Uh, if, if you don't know what that is, it's a reference to in, in the dedication of the book. She says, "Thank you to my readers, and you're going to fill a bucket full of your tears by the end." I, I think that might be a little overblown. I thought the ending was quite dramatic and and, and fairly uh, appropriate, exciting, tragic. However, we can we can definitely talk about that. But uh, I didn't actually shed any tears. It wasn't that type of book for me. Yeah, I. This is something that comes up for Charles and I too. Is I think tragic is a great word for it, Stephen. That it definitely reaches a point that is 
it it hits hard, but it doesn't hit hard it, in a sentimental way, I guess, for us anyway. I know lots mm-hmm. of people do. I've seen like video reactions to finishing it where people do cry a lot. And and I'll cry oh, wow. at reading books for sure. Like reading The Paper Menagerie, I, I cried at that twice. And I think this one, just not like sentimental, emotional, and it felt more inevitable the way that it ended. So mm. I was pretty prepared for it and kind of like that's yeah. that's the way it had to go. And it's a it's a bummer. It's grimdark, but it's also like, yeah, that was that was right. That was satisfying. Maybe yeah, we're just I ruined mean, too much Abercrombie yeah. and such. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. that there's, you know, for a lot of times there's fate's worse than death. You know what I mean? And I was afraid that that was going to happen to our main character and luckily it didn't. So, you know, I was like, I was okay mm-hmm. with that fate because I was done reading the book anyway. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, sometimes yeah, the like, ending felt very inevitable, I would say. And it yeah. was more of a tragedy, but it, it wasn't like a tear jerk response. You know, it wasn't sentimental. It was mm-hmm. very tragic though. Very mm-hmm. dramatic. Yeah, honestly, maybe this is the first hot take of the episode, but I feel like if you were filling your bucket with tears, you almost missed the point of the book. Like, I don't think that the point well, of the book was to attach you to Rin so much. That, so th- it's a hot burning God take. That's a burning <laughs> hot take there, Stephen. I maybe, think, maybe it's a well, spicy take. I think that there's something to how tight we are to Rin's perspective and how much we get to watch her journey in a way that we can understand how she got to the point that she got to. Like, I I think that the whole yeah. Poppy War trilogy is about how someone who is rendered powerless ends up when they get the opportunity to seize power, pretty much lashing out and not knowing how to, uh, pretty much live in a world as someone who has the capability for violence because all that they've seen done to them is so bad. And I think we, I don't know. I I was very attached to Rin at the start, like of the Poppy War, like the first book. And then Mm -hmm. slowly but surely I was like, oh no, it's just getting to the point that you are a monster and you have to go. But if you're still latched on to that early first book, Rin, I could see how it would hit you really hard, just how she reached this point, even if it was inevitable, even if she she kind of needed to go at the end. It was still, it's sad, I guess, but because it's like that had to happen, I'm glad that Rin's out of the picture. That's why it didn't tear jerk for me. And, and the author themselves, uh, you know, herself, oh, uh, Rebecca Kwong, if she's saying the bucket of tears thing, I'm like, I guess that's the point, sort of, but uh, it just didn't hit that way for me. So she said that the inspiration for the for the series was kind of this focus on Mao and the speculative fiction with this question of how does someone go from being like a backwater no one to killing millions of people? And, and it, like, what is that transformation? How does that progress through? And that's what we've seen through these three books. So I think the focus of the trilogy is much more on answering or asking maybe these types of questions. She doesn't necessarily answer them. Some some yes, some no. But I, I don't think it's more on the side of trying to get you to emotionally attach to them and killing them and making you cry. I think it's more on just like seeing the development of a monster, so to speak, and also, you know, some of these uh, deeper philosophical questions, questions around colonialism, questions around history, all these types of things. So that that's why I say I, I don't think that's the point. I think it's much more around these more and important questions about like history and life and how we interpret those things. Right. I think Kwong did a really like part of why I love Rin as a character so much is that and, and Adon and I've talked about this quite a bit is her character growth, you know, the moments we cheer for her when she, you know, liberates herself from her, like her step family and she studies really hard. And when she wins battles and when she like overthrows the people that are trying to oppress her, we're cheering for her the entire way. But when you objectively take a step back and look at what she's done, she's like 
burned villages to the ground and killed millions of people. She's even resorted to self-harm to study. You know, we're cheering for her. These are moments where she's growing and she's like, you know, standing Mm -hmm. up for herself. But these are also the moments where she's embracing the Phoenix God and burning everything around her. So that to me is like, you can fall in love with Rin, the character that's so close to the perspective of the story that you're reading and you're cheering for her. But for me, the disconnect is she is like a Mao type where she is like a tyrannical warlord, essentially, and she's murdered tons of people. So for me, that's where that tragedy comes in. And that's why I'm not so emotionally connected. But I love Rin as a character for those reasons as well. One of one brave thing that I think that this book did pretty well was kind of um, dive into Rin's head about how she was rationalizing these things. Um, you know, she kind of, she, Oh yeah. Um, she yeah. goes in and she kind of almost has a conversation with Alton every time she has to do something brutal and like, she like relives it enough time so that it stops um, becoming meaningful for her almost. And that's pretty brave because like, I don't know if that's actually, you know, like I'm sure nobody knows how Mao or how any like ruthless dictator like rationalizes um, the things that they do. But I thought it was cool that she attempted to do that. And I thought that that part of the book actually like um, was one of my favorites when we got to see her doing that. So. Yeah, I actually watched a little interview with uh, Rebecca Kwong. And one of the things that she says is along the way, Rin is always suppressing her emotions and, and rationalizing things away. And I think that really makes her a really compelling read because we see her becoming just losing her humanity slowly and rationalizing things away. And every time it's like a situation where she's got to make the choice to use people as pawns on the chessboard and sacrifice. And But like the, the question, I guess, that we ask or, or the book asks is, you know, was this really necessary? Did she need to do it this way? Did history, did real history on earth, right? Did did, uh, history there need to unfold in the same way? And uh, I would say maybe it didn't. Like there, I think are a lot of points where she could have decided to stop fighting or she could have approached things in a different way. And I guess uh, Rebecca Kwong would say maybe Chinese history could have unfolded in different ways as well. Yeah, I yeah, think what that... makes uh, Rin such a great antihero is like what Ben was saying is the commitment to Rin's perspective. And we know that Rin has gone through so many horrible things and that has affected her ability to have healthy relationships and express her emotions in a healthy way. And that's what brought her down this path. And I just loved reading that. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that this balance of Rin's vulnerability and the fact that she has these emotional reactions, like you were talking about, Stephen, even if she suppresses them and uh, then does these horrible things, I think it makes her such an intriguing, complex character that she's uh, she is feeling the guilt. She is actually having these reactions when there's other there's other. I don't know if I'd call even. I'm thinking of Yorg from Mark Lawrence's work, and we love Mark Lawrence's work, but it's a a different character, a more straightforward character, I think, and someone like Yorg, who's more just like a pretty bad dude, but doesn't have this same vulnerability. And Rin is so complex with all that. And and I think like Charles was saying, uh, to bring that back to this idea of did things have to go this way? It's like, maybe Rin, like the world's better if Rin just at the start accepts like, I'm going to go get married to this older man and I'm just going to accept this horrible life. And yeah, all, a lot of people would probably be alive that aren't by the end of The Burning God because so few people <laughs> yeah. are alive by the end of The Burning God. <laughs> yeah, and, and, But we don't, it's so tough because we don't want that for Rin at that point. And I think that's what makes this so grim dark is that all these things that Rin gets set up to have to deal with it's like well we don't want her to get stuck in a situation with this old guy that she's never met we want her to find a way to synagogue but that kind of sets her on this path that makes things worse and it's like it's so brutal yeah um what what do you guys think about the they they kind of made this distinction I'm sorry you might hear a garbage truck outside my window right now um in the middle of the book they made this distinction between when 
when Rin like killed somebody that she didn't have to, it was like more like a murder for her versus like a, like a kill in battle. I think it was when she like wanted like a place on this council or whatever, and so she she poisoned the the council member. Did you did that distinction hit? Oh yeah, you? she like, poisoned I, like the. I was like, you probably killed Lord. millions of people, yeah. you know? Yeah, like what? I mean, to me, she spent like a lot of time kind of navel gazing on that um, particular moment, but maybe maybe right. it was imp- impactful. It just wasn't for me. Yeah, those early scenes in this book, like for me, like when we were reading the first two books in this trilogy, I was like, man, Rin has this weird relationship with people that have authority over her and maybe things that she should have seen coming a mile away. People obviously using her like she has so much power. Why doesn't she just assume command? Like these are the things you're like trying to grab Rin by the shoulders and, and shake her and tell her to do. And then I feel like in this book we get all of that and we get to see like the negative reactions to that so i think in the beginning of this book when she's dealing with monkey province and you know shaking things up right away i think that's kind of like her lesson learned from the last book the dragon republic and it's like you know just because they have authority over me doesn't mean i can't kill them right now kind of a thing which i kind of was cheering as well i was like finally you're learning these lessons but it's like okay you're (laughs) You're messing with the rebellion. Yeah, about time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was nice to see that because, like you say, the, the I think Gurubai, the the warlord over in Monkey, I might have pronounced that wrong. And then Soji, the guy who seemed like he would set up to like maybe be a pretty competent leader, but then did her wrong, so she had him ripped apart. Those people were kind of the viceroy of the second book, except she played it differently. Yeah. And thus her character went on a different path and progressed and now went from becoming the, you know, the tool that the leader just points and says, go burn this thing up to now. She's the one making the decisions, which was good. Like she needed to, her character definitely needed to go in that direction. It was about time. Yeah. Yeah, and then so I guess- like, as much as Gorabai is about Vaisra, I also made the connection that Soji is kind of like how we deal with Alton now with modern Rin. It's like, oh, like I'm not going to get bogged down in the fact that we have a similar upbringing and that you're like this charismatic leader. Like I don't mm. care about any of that anymore because I'm, you know, my own person now and I have power and you know, so I thought the way she dealt with Gurabai and Soji is kind of like Vaisra and Alton with Rin 2.0. <laughs> they don't last long. <laughs> and I guess that uh, tearing apart of Soji was another parallel to Mao. This is something that happened like along the, the long march um, back when he was seizing power. And it had some parallels as well to uh, like the Cultural Revolution when she's telling him that he needs to you know, confess and kind of like put them on this public trial. That's something that uh, we see in Chinese history as well. I really appreciate those things. Uh, the, the, the history lesson was not supposed to be one-to-one and I was fine with that. But then when you got these little nuggets where you're like, Oh, that must be that thing. Like I, as someone who doesn't know much about Chinese history, other than what I've learned from reading this series and the three body problem series, I've enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed learning more as well. Yeah, totally agree, Stephen. I think that this is one of those series that expands my perspective of what contemporary fantasy can be compared to some of the other stuff that we've read that kind of rehashes this medi- medieval European mm-hmm. setting. And, and I, I love those stories. And it's nice to get a story that draws from uh, Chinese history and Asian history and to get from someone who's such an expert in that area, I do feel like I, I learn a lot. And I, it also inspires me to want to actually look up more about the real events like I, I can tell yeah. you did there, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, look, we're just four white guys trying to read through fantasy and, <laughs> and learn a little bit about Asian history. So we're probably in no position to say anything profound here. But I know one of the goals of writing this series for her was to bring Chinese history more into light and, and get more people reading it. So uh, for, to, to that extent, it was a big success. For sure. Well said, Stephen. Well said. So we've talked kind of like big picture stuff. Was, was there like... 
for me, one of the negatives of the book was pacing. But did you guys like this book's pacing? Like, I thought there were so many mini climaxes oh, really? in it that it just like, I don't know, kind of, I was like, I was like, oh, surely this is going to be like the end of the book. And then I looked down and there's just like seven more hours left in the audio book. Um, and I think one of the I first times that, that happened Kwong's was when they were like, pacing is the so unique. Yeah. Unique yeah, is, the mountain guess, felt like it's <laughs> like a big climax. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, one of the things that strikes me is like Kwong's writing style. If you're like, oh, summarize Kwong's writing style in like a few words, I'd just be like pacing. It would be way, way at the top because for me, this whole series has told so much plot in so few pages. And mm-hmm. for me, it was almost kind of refreshing because so often in fantasy and like we just started Wheel of Time as any Phantology fan that checked us out when uh, we had steven on for a little Wheel of bit Time. different pacing <laughs> yeah little so bit. it's like to to compare the two is crazy and so for me it had like a really modern feel it was kind of and just how it paralleled rin's just frantic lifestyle i i, I don't know so much happened and the pacing it never had this filler kind of moment it never felt like it dragged at all and stuff was always happening and um I, I personally, it kept things interesting for me at the very least. <laughs> yeah, I, I have think some it's pros worth... and cons. Yeah, go ahead, Dylan. Yeah, Tell us good. what you think. Okay. I'll, oh. <laughs> I think that it's one of those like bug feature moments. Like, is it a bug? Is mm-hmm. it a feature? Like, sure. if you're invested in <laughs> some of these storylines, like, it sounds like Ben was invested in the trifecta going in and yeah. potentially having a big part of the end of this thing and i'll say when i was reading it i too was like oh here comes the trifecta and it's going to be trifecta against the uh, like hesperians (laughs) and that'll be the big end and then that moment happens on the mountain and it's like it's so hard to believe that they're even dead because they're so used to these storylines where it comes to a head with the thing that's being built and uh kwong quite literally just blows all of that up right in front of us and Mm -hmm. i think that it's yeah it it's a kind of thing i i like the breakneck pacing of that but i think it's totally valid to be like wait no like the climax was supposed to come later not here and then again here and then again here yeah yeah it's, it's something we're we're probably not as useful or something we're not as used to i should say yeah yeah, I guess maybe one of those big moments I would have wished would have happened at the end of the second book. Because I feel like at the end of the second book, it just kind of peters out. Like, yeah, she gets betrayed by Naja and stuff happens. But like, I wish that there's more of a climactic end to the second book. And I think that one of those would have fit well in there. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, so maybe my the pacing case, of the series. Um, when we did the Dragon Republic episode was I had the same feelings that you did, Ben, about that kind of betrayal and the ending of that book. And I, I was kind of like eh, pushing back a little bit on the ending of this one. But it definitely makes up for we get like three endings in this book. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I almost think that this book ended in a similar way to Dragon Republic, where we have the big climax at Arlong, and then we have like a long period of just kind of like, okay, we're figuring things out now. And it's a little bit, but the pacing is still fast, but the big things aren't really happening. And then at the end, we have the, the big thing in both books. So I, I think they're pretty similar <laughs> structures. Uh, right. My, my pro, I, I see what you guys are saying as far as like the pacing really lends to Rin's character. It makes it exciting to read. Things are always happening. I really enjoy that. I would say on the con side, sometimes things are happening so fast that there's not room to really like sit down and enjoy some of the longer set piece type like action sequences, which she mm. really glosses over for the most part like there's the scene where they take the the, the rich city that they call the whore and they uh they, they send in the earthquake guy who i don't remember his name Duji, i think and uh he takes down the the walls and like there's a little bit of a scene there but then it's like okay then they go sack the city and rin kills a lot of people and then there's the scene where they at the end when they fight with the dragon and the phoenix and that goes on for a little bit then they go into the spiritual plane and kind of duke it out and then it's over and they're like okay we've got our long now I, I enjoy some of those like action-y type sequences a little bit more. And I, I felt like I missed that a little bit. Mm, 
that you make some interesting points there, Stephen. I, it makes me think about the. I know we're all big Brandon Sanderson fans in the mix here, and he talks sometimes about scene sequel format as like mm. when you're writing a chapter or scene in a book. Usually, you get your action. Then you get your character's process, what just happened. Then you get your action again. And it's the, the scene is the more action. And the sequel is the let's process it. And mm. Kwong is a little bit more scene, 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 <laughs> right? Like, yeah. it's just this happened and this happened, then this happened. And like y'all are saying, yeah, it matches this frenetic, rin, all out, relentless, uh, can't stop moving bit. But yeah, like. Sometimes you want to process a little bit. Rin doesn't. <laughs> therefore, we He's don't get to. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. yeah. Well, we, yeah. And, and maybe thing- that's why. It's because Rin is somewhat of an unreliable narrator and she's the one you're following. So you're just going to get things in the way that she experiences it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. One, and I would say, I you know, that- you, oh, go ahead, Ben. Oh, sorry. I think there's a bit of a it. lag, but um, one thing yeah, I think that zoom-like. was done really well. <laughs> yeah. One thing that was done really well was that all these kind of side characters, specifically like the Psych 2.0, they were like sprinkled in really well throughout the book. Like how she kind of finds the boy that was kind of trapped under the rubble and she she finds like she rescues the two sisters. Like all those characters that I feel like in the previous two books would have just yeah, been part of yeah. the grim dark setting kind of really did come back and played a bigger part. And so I was pleasantly surprised about that agreed let's talk more about those guys so the the whole training of the new shamans this has been hinted at since the dragon republic when she's like hey we should have a shaman army and and nothing happens on it in that book but it it does in in this book uh what do you guys think of that I, i i mean that was kind of a fun thing but also a somewhat tragic thing is they didn't really make it other than the healer girl who i think right. made it <laughs> that's what we talked about we're like i think she made it and that's kind of a hopeful thing to think about is that the healer is the one that gets to be one of the last shamans in this new age you know so for me i thought these you know these moments were quite interesting um the way that we are kind of introduced to them. You know, I feel like this is Rin, you know, we had talked about with the monkey warlord and with Soji of Rin kind of relearning her lessons. I feel like this is, Mm -hmm. we're in part two of the story or now into part three because of Mount T and Sean, like the, this is kind of her learning that lesson again, where she recognizes like the dragon emperor as someone who should not be in the picture. No, she's not going to be controlled anymore. Instead, she's going to make her own army. And I think we finally get that because she had been the subservient role looking for authority for two books now. And I think this is just another one of those times where Ren has, for lack of a better phrase, learned her lesson and is now raising her own army. So I thought that was kind of a unique way for the story to go. And in terms of action pieces, we needed more shamans. They're fun. They're cool. The potential for them is, is Def- fun. Oh, definitely. Well. Definitely. Yeah. I, I like the Professor Rin moments. Yeah. I think that we, we also learn a lot about Rin through how she chooses to teach other people. I I ha- there's this moment where Papaji, I think, is the character, uh, one of the ones that Rin is training. The, the poison. Is, yeah, the poison. Yeah. Girl. And she's thinking about quitting, and Rin says to her, that's power, and you're not giving that up. I know you, you're me, is kind of mm-hmm. her way of saying, oh, no, you're you're all in on this. And I think mm-hmm. she sees in Papaji that same bit that we've been talking about with uh, what what Rin has dealt with herself. It's someone who's been rendered powerless their whole lives, gets his opportunity toward power, and Rin can tell, like, no, people like me who've had to deal with that, they are not going to give up power, and they'll even die pursuing it, and, and Papaji does, and, and, and so does Rin. And it's, uh, I think, y- you learn a lot by how someone chooses to teach, and I think we got to learn more about Rin, and that's what this whole book is about, is about Rin for yeah. me. One thing that I thought was interesting was how Rin is so sympathetic and has a hard time with even committing to psych to to kind of train and suffer a similar fate that she does. 
Like she has no problems wiping a whole continent, like devoid of life. She has no problems like killing on mass destruction. But like five people, she like has this huge internal conflict of, oh, am I gonna like like make them experience the same fate as I do? And so it kind of like shows you kind of how wrapped up in herself she is sometimes where um you know life is life you know like if she's willing to kill hundreds of people on the battle in the battle the previous day she should be able to sacrifice five troops this way you know right so i don't know that was kind of interesting does a really good job of just like dehumanizing the masses out there in mugen and and in the republic etc but then when she is confronted with someone who is alive and has a nice backstory like Papaji does, who makes her kind of a, a nice little tragic minor character, or later on when she sees the masses that are uh, starving terribly and are bloated and, and dying, like she wants to help them. So there is some good there at the core of her, but I, she's just, I guess, too much of a psycho to really ever embrace that yeah steven i think you touch on some really good points there the way i've always seen it tries to if you go back and look at all those times when she made these horrible choices you have to think about what her her level of responsibility she assumed in the decision like sometimes she's like oh i channeled the phoenix and like Mm, something happened and it's like oh i was just working for the dragon emperor like that you know i'm following orders or i'm doing something for someone else you know like alton and she always kind of shirked away from responsibility because she never wanted to be confronted with that decision so i think they made the really interesting parallel between like oh yeah i can kill a whole continent but when it gets to the personal level and i can't deny my responsibility in this then it becomes like a lot more difficult for me. And we know Rin is a very flawed human being. So to see her kind of grapple with that is super interesting. And Stephen brings up, well, actually one of my favorite scenes in this book, which is when she's, you know, beaten everybody and she's going back to her hometown and everyone is starving and there's nothing she can do. And she actually ends up causing Mm -hmm. more damage by destroying their economy, by burning down all their poppy fields. And it's such a great, moment where it's like she's her only use is destruction and when you no longer have the means for destruction and you're trying to build something you're trying to build civilization she's powerless which is such an interesting um it was such an interesting moment and and one that really made the ending where it's like there's no place for rin anymore feel that much more earned Mm -hmm. i got yeah i got a couple things i want to say because y'all are making such awesome points and one is on this can rin understand what it means to destroy an entire continent versus what it means to deal with the potential death of one other person and it made me think there's this joseph stalin quote uh that y'all probably heard that is the death of one man is a tragedy the death of millions is a statistic and Mm -hmm. i think that that you know as another awful person who was responsible for uh, countless deaths was Stalin and uh, that's Rin as well uh, is like at the scale of an entire continent especially made up of people who Rin was able to dehumanize that much uh, it was just a statistic to her it was just like oh yeah now that thing is gone but when she deals with these actual people because rin does have that vulnerable side to her it's much harder Mm -hmm. and uh uh, i have another quote i don't know if y'all stuff you want to say on that but i have another quote on the on the poppy (laughs) uh fields burning part but uh yeah if people have i I have a quote i I, I have a quote from Mao. i I don't remember the exact quote actually so i'm going to paraphrase a quote but it's something like you know, if half the people are are starving, then what do you do? Well, you let them starve, and then you've got food for everyone else. So <laughs> it, it's not a problem oh, anymore. Gosh. Everyone else is is well fed. <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> yeah, no, Let, I mean that's just quote, how. Now, okay, yeah, no, I mean that's just how savage those folks all, all were, and I think Rin really gives us a chance to get in the head of someone like that, just like. You know, uh, y'all are saying what Kwong's intention was. And I mm-hmm. think we, though we can still see them as horrible, we can start to understand how someone starts moving in that direction through these lenses. And these quotes can kind of illustrate like 
where these people's heads were at, and, and we saw Rin get there. But the the other quote is is from uh, the prose of Kwong's book, and it was more on this like when she's watching the poppy fields burning. If I remember correctly, the it's her army that burns down the poppy fields, right? I, Not, think, it was I don't think it ever actually the, says the citizens. I'm pretty. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I feel like that's kind of an open question, isn't it? Yeah, well, they had like, because she had given a speech to try and rally them, like, hey, let's do this. And then they were like kind of right. heckling her, like, oh, you have to feed us first before you like launch another battle. And then like the next morning, she wakes up to the poppy. Right. Or, so I feel like it's kind of, a, I assume that it was like the the citizens kind of revolted and did it. You know, but that's maybe, what I thought got too. It. Got it. Okay, that's on yeah. me. <laughs> Although and, it also could have been some traitor that was in their midst that was never really resolved. That's true. Yeah, I think it's fair. I The part I felt confident about was that it wasn't like Rin went out and burned them because she was yeah. so... She, that was her one salvation. That was her one yeah, chance she was to into make it. things work. And then she comes out and she sees all them burning and the line that we get is she she couldn't call her god to stop this the phoenix could only start fires it couldn't put them out and that is along lines of charles's point about this uh, she's so powerful she has the powers of a literal god but all the god can do is destroy things and when she's faced with this like this is my one opportunity i need to make something not to burn she yeah. can't do anything about it. All she could do would be make the burning happen faster. And and I think that's such a big moment for Rin that helps lead her toward the, her eventual conclusion that the world needs her not to be in it if it's ever going to heal. I love that uh, you're bringing up some quotes because I think another strong point of the series is just her literary, like her prose skills. Very well really? written, very tightly written. Lots of... I think lots of pretty profound things sprinkled in. So there's a lot of things you could quote from this series. For sure. Yeah. I love how um, modern it feels too. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted, I wanted to get Steven's reaction on something because we, when we talked about this on like discord and stuff, Steven's favorite ha- character has always been Katai. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steven, but um, yeah, you always that, been Katai. Am I just like the, the, the hot take? guy that's what you're trying to get right now (laughs) well i feel like that was one of my least favorite characters because he was so (laughs) one-dimensional to me really wow bite bite. yeah (laughs) yeah he he was so one-dimensional he never did anything unexpected and it was just he was just there to contrast rin and the fact that he had to die with her at the end was okay with me because he was always just Rin's companion, you know? So I don't know. Well, what did you, what do you think about that, Steven? Oh man. I know that you probably see Steven, your response. Lot, Duke so. it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, like, like Katai, I feel like I'm always the smartest one out there. No, uh, <laughs> It's too one dimensional, though, Stephen. Stop being so yeah, smart. I, I, I'm pretty boring, I guess. So uh, I see what you mean I, a little bit. I guess. I, I guess now that you say that, my thought is maybe he's one dimensional because Rin just sees him as being really one dimensional. We get a little bit of his backstory, you know, like in the in the second book in Dragon Republic when he learns that his father dies. You know, he doesn't like that. And uh, I, I think a question I wanted to ask about Katai. So maybe I'm kind of dodging your question and asking another question, but how culpable is he with everything that Rin has done? Because Rin is basically like the fire, but he's kind of the one who makes sure that what the, where the fire wants to go, like the fire actually gets there. Maybe there, I'm this is a terrible analogy, but uh, you know he's the one who makes it all happen, right? Like Rin's like, hey, I want to go burn that thing down. And he's like, okay, here are the steps you need to do to get there. At some point, could he have said, "Hey, Rin, like we're not going to do this. This is wrong," well, or well, he does at the end. was Rin, but not till the end, right? Not until he's they've killed millions and caused a famine and the world's falling apart. Hmm. That's yeah. you, you kind of raised my eyebrows. I think that there. was it. We found his line. Yeah, and you know, 
it's how we're so close to Rin's perspective, right? And one of the things we were praising earlier is the commitment to Rin's perspective as a narrator. And Stephen, you had mentioned it's how Rin sees Kate. And I think especially towards the end of this book, when the paranoia sets in, you know, there's plenty of times oh, yeah. Rin sees Kate as a tool and Rin abuses Kate. I mean, Kate is along for the ride. So it's my belief that he's 100% culpable to all of these things. But what makes Kate interesting for me is that he's always like, he always loves Rin. I think he sees Rin suffering at times and is sticking with her. And he does make attempts to bridge like the like make peace between Rin and Neja multiple times and even at the end as well. And I can kind of get the mm-hmm. sense at the end that he was walking on eggshells a bit with Rin and he was kind of looking to Venka like, what are we going to do? And although it's never explicitly mentioned, I do believe Rin and Venka kind of were going behind Rin's back trying to, I mean, Kate and Venka. Uh, we're going behind Rin's back trying to make peace with Neja. So I do think he's walking mm. on eggshells around her and is afraid of her. But like, as you said, Rin's perspective on Kate can be one dimensional at times. And that's why I think Kate is uh, an interesting character. I think the reason why he does what he does is because he, this is what he's really good at, mm-hmm. like organizing things and, uh, making it happen and being a military uh, strategist. And so he's got this opportunity to do what he's good at. It's like, man, I'm, I'm going to do it. And the cause is somewhat just, right? We're kicking out the Hesperians and, right. uh, and, and Vicera and the Republic. You know, they, they messed with us. So we're going to get him back. Uh, at some point, maybe I, I would say if he was really a noble character that I could really get behind, I, I think he should have drawn the line sooner but it was almost kind of like Rin, like he was along. Yes, he was along for the ride, but like Rin, he was faced with a bunch of impossible situations where at the end he was just trying to hold the country together and, and eventually he decided Rin had to go. But uh, maybe I would have liked to see him do something sooner. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think he's culpable. I think I think we needed he... one. Oh, sorry. You got it, Ben. Okay, I was going to say, I think we needed one scene similar to how we got Nijah at the very end, um, where he kind of, we got like a page of his viewpoint uh, regarding Rin and like everything she meant to him, but like she yeah. he recognized that she was like a little off her rockers. Like we needed one viewpoint like that from, from Katai, like just to say, this is what my perspective was throughout it all. I loved her, but I feared her it's probably good that she's not here. You know what I mean? Like we needed something like that from him in order to make him more than one dimensional. Yeah. It would be interesting to see Katai outside of the lens of uh, Rin for sure. I would definitely like to see how he kind of justified some of his actions and maybe see how much of a part he really had in the end when the like exchange of notes and information and like Neja had someone on the inside. We don't really know who that was, but I'd like to see how, you know, involved Kitai was and all of that. It wouldn't surprise me if he was trying to do a whole lot of that. I I'm pretty convinced that (laughs) he was the main culprit here. Cause there's a few things or just at the end. I'd say probably throughout, but more convincingly at hmm. the end. Like, okay. I think that, yeah, maybe him and Vanka were involved, but there's a few things that I point to, and I think it's never explicitly stated in the text, so it is up for interpretation who was the quote-unquote traitor uh, leaving the notes, which I do right. think was a bad, at, like a, a poorly done attempt at creating some sort of truce or understanding but with Rin it was not going to ever be accomplished by like leaving random notes near her that she couldn't tell who was (laughs) sending them because she's already paranoid but whatever and and the part if if he was involved in that Kitai is totally culpable for making things even worse and exacerbating Rin's paranoia but I'll also say that the reason I think it was Kite, Kitai, uh, sorry, I, I, y'all have it right, but I, Charles and I were saying Kite on our podcast. <laughs> but I think that Kitai is, uh, first off, when 
the food comes for Rin that's poisoned, and uh, you know, R.I.P. Bin Bin. R.I.P. Bin Bin, the dog that the poor yeah, pooch had, had <laughs> to die because of poison food. But when the p- poison comes, and there's a note that had like pretty much said like, "Don't eat the food." <laughs> would... Venka doesn't do anything. And Kitai just like is like no like don't eat the food definitely don't do it so he maybe knew what was in that note but then you're believing that Venka if she was the traitor was just going to let Rin get poisoned uh, and then the other bit there is that uh, when Rin was accusing Venka of being a traitor it was uh, Kitai who was like no like and he's usually very composed very like oh we should think everything mm-hmm. out like let's consider all the options but he was just yelling like no no she's not a traitor <laughs> and i'm like why is he so adamant and so convinced because he knows she's not the traitor because he is so i feel mm-hmm. pretty it, so I, I don't know i came away a lot stronger on the like Kitai was the like i think he meant he had good intention so i i hesitate to say traitor strongly but he was the person leaving the notes and that's why he's culpable because it's like dude no you know rin really well this is not going to help like just try anything else yeah <laughs> interesting that's okay i hadn't really thought about it that way ben ben what was your take on who the traitor was yeah similar i just kind of assumed that it was this infiltrated somehow but this makes a lot more sense so I'm, i can get behind this this uh theory that it was katai hmm I had a similar thought as you. I thought it was Neja's, uh, you know, Republican forces, Asperian allies, whatever, that were spying on them. And I pretty much just like stuck, uh, stuck with what the novel was wanting me yeah. to believe that Rin was getting more and more uh, paranoid and, and losing it. So I guess I'm not really. I need to reevaluate my my thoughts. Are I'm, I'm not sure. One more that I'm remembering hmm. is when we do get like a page of Neja at the end, he calls Kitai like the go between, something of that nature, um, hmm. between the two of them. Like he says, like, oh, of course, Kitai, the go between. Might I'm paraphrasing, but it says like the person who is always between the two of them. So I think something. I don't know. I I feel strongly about that one because yeah. I know. Uh, so uh, Rebecca Kwong was asked this question in oh. an interview that I watched, Let's hear it. and she she didn't say she didn't come down either way on if it was right. Katai or if it was Venka or if there was no traitor. She said it's she she likened it actually to Inception with the top with Christopher Nolan, which is like uh, still spinning. So you guys decide. And I know that's maybe unfair, but that's my you know license as the author to put that out there. So okay. up to debate. For sure. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Neja. We haven't really uh we we haven't dived into him full on. He he wasn't in this book a whole lot. I mean, obviously he was a big part of it because they were always fighting against him, but he really just kind of showed up for the fights. And uh, my take on Neja, he's another character that I really liked, and I just feel really bad for the guy like he was put in a terrible situation but you know so were our other characters and and maybe he handled it better because he was willing to compromise and not be psycho crazy like Rin was Hmm. yeah there's a couple interesting like things around Neja and his relationship with the Hesperians versus Rin's and I think it just comes down to this theme of like colonization and the different ways that the Hesperians were kind of destroying their culture. And one is obviously the military force. Mm. They're occupying cities. But there's interesting scenes in this book where, like, the part that Nezh is willing to compromise on, it's like, we need to work with them and they can get us whatever we want. And, like, they're the future. They're just so far ahead of us that, you know, we need to come with some sort of compromise. And then Rin sees, like, all these people wearing Hesperian clothes and, you know, churches being erected in the cities and the architecture changing. And it's, it's almost like a violation to see that stuff happening in her own city. Mm -hmm. So like the difference in how they view the Hesperians for Rin is no surprise, like a hundred percent. No, like they're destroying everything. And then there's just along the lines of like, you know, this is the inevitable future that we're marching towards. And I'm trying to make the best of, what we have and that's why i love the end is kind of like a compromise from the two rinse like here i'll level the playing field for you and uh good luck (laughs) there's a lot there there's a lot there that you said charles 
<laughs> who, want, who wants to run off that? <laughs> no one, huh? I'll say I love it. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take it then. You said it all, Someone Charles. help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no I, 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 Dylan, you're my co-host. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Phantology podcast. I mean, you gotta let the stars shine. Yeah, I want to hear Steven's opinion. <laughs> so I, I'm with you. I'm with you for the. I don't know if uh, there's necessarily an opinion that I have, but I think colonialism, obviously, a huge part of the of the series of this book specifically. I think it's really cool that. By the end, we kind of get this open question of what would have happened to China if Mao had lost and how would colonial powers have continued to interact with China. And that's really fascinating because obviously that didn't happen. And, you know, the years since have have shaped the country. And I think one of the themes here is this just idea that colonialism has this really long reaching effect on reality. And what we're seeing now in the world is so much affected by what history has done for years prior. There's a line right at the end where uh, maybe Dylan has this marked down, but it's something like, you know, history is this vicious circle. And so Rin, as part of her sacrifice, kind of breaks that circle a little bit. Um, Yeah. That's my thought. I (laughs) I, I thought it was interesting how... In the end, Rin made the same choice as Naja, which was to kind of sacrifice herself so that the nation could continue. And that and that, that was kind of, in a sense, bowing to colonialism. I thought it was also crazy how um, Katai had those doubts, like those pervasive thoughts about like, oh, are the Hesperians really just better, more intelligent than we are or whatever? Like, it's crazy how like that part of colonialism was so yeah. well, like so fine tunely addressed. So I appreciate that part. And mm-hmm. then I feel like that to top it all off, I love Ren's punishment to the gray lady, like whatever her name is, like the gray missionary who ended up getting like locked like into Petra. the Pantheon. Pet- yeah, Petra. Yeah. It was just like such a great, like at least that character got their come up and like it was sad to see that the rest of the um, like rest of the conquerors didn't get their comeuppance, but at least she did. So, yeah, I don't know. That was yeah a, a moment there, where I, that I that was, was cheering kind of like, for Rin. Yeah, Rin. Rin. Rin kind of sucked big time by the end of the book, but that was a moment where I was like, "Heck yeah!" Like take that, Petra, <laughs> the real villain. Well, I guess sucked as a person. <laughs> I mean, as a character, they don't. Oh yeah, Rin yeah, yeah, is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Rin's one of my favorite. Char- you know, I anyone who's probably paying attention to my social media st- stuff, the, all those gifs that you love, Stephen, will know that. Like, I, I love these these characters that are really intriguing and complex and kind of like at the end of the day, they're just rationalizing being a mm-hmm. terrible person. Uh, I won't say for spoiler reasons for another series, I won't say who I'm often talking about around that, but I know, uh, I know <laughs> Steven's well aware. Uh, I know there's I, yeah, a recent some... episode of friends talking fantasy podcast where you discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there might be. And I think that, yeah, Rin really, really awful person by the end, but we first off love how, complex she is love how we get to see her become this from this these like humble beginnings of a just some girl growing up in a really crappy situation and then uh, like coming all this way to get all this power going through all this growth that as as charles was mentioning all this growth that actually makes her a worse person but is totally fair given what's going on in her circumstances and i think that we get this kind of like that that final moment i'm sure we're we're building toward here at steven eventually is this like what oh, we yes. decides to to do ultimately i'm so interested in that when we do get get there yeah i, I think we're probably ready to to talk about the climb well the final climax is as Ben would say, right? The, yeah. the big one after all of the <laughs> mini climaxes. Uh, okay, so what do we think? She sacrifices herself. Uh, some people on on Discord, on Phantology Discord, were uh, a little bit dissatisfied that she got like a, a noble martyr 
ending, but I know, I know Dylan, you kind of had a, a nice summation of your thoughts there. Yeah, no, I was just thinking about, cause I wrote that, I think a little closer to when I, I finished it. I was trying to think, mm-hmm. cause I, I was, I definitely had a more just like emotional, like this felt right. Like this was inevitable. This felt right. It, feeling about how that ending was good but then when i saw people on the phantology discord being like i didn't like that she was a martyr i didn't like that she kind of got this moment of redemption i was like i don't know why why do i feel like it's it's good despite that and where where i kind of landed ultimately was that it was it felt appropriate for rin as a character to finally reach this point after she's witnessed especially that moment at the the poppy fields like all i can do is destroy she's Mm kind of between a rock and a hard place by the end there where it's like i'm choosing as ben mentioned like a fate worse than death probably like if i keep fighting here i'm just going to get captured by the hesperians and then it's going to end up even worse for me uh, or I could make this rash, relentless, ruthless decision to just take myself out of the equation entirely. And she knows how bad a person she's become. She sees in Kite maybe the one person that she still like kind of trusts as she's really becoming paranoid at the end. That like even he's like, you got to get out of here. Uh, even like I'm willing to die to get you out of here. She's fine. Like she makes that one rash, relentless, ruthless dare I say it, Rin decision, uh, where she, <laughs> she's an uh, now. There. yes, uh, where she just ends it for herself. And it's not martyrdom. She doesn't end up like with some great rebellion that then starts up that defeats the Hesperians because of it. It's just what had to happen. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I'm at. Maybe it's a little bit of redemption. Mm. That's interesting. Did they, so the Discord, call, the Discord said that Rin uh, had this kind of martyr-like ending to her? Because I, 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 ne- I never considered that. Like, to me, Rin is, is not a martyr. Like, what happened was this, like, inevitable tragedy to her very dramatic arc. And even Neja, looking down at her body, is like, you like left me with this like this is like you like my fate's worse than yours Mm -hmm. you know like i i like i hate you for it i think he even says so it's like i I, i'm not sure i i think we know from like the poppy fields where it's like all she can do is destroy and that's just ruin their relationship with the hesperians that it was this again with rin it's always going straight from a to b and in her own logic, she puzzled out that like that next step is her taking her own life and Neja delivering her body to the Hesperians. And I mean, that's kind of a selfless act, but I don't consider it a, this martyr act because it's just so like nothing ha- like it's just a horrible situation. And the situation is still very complicated and by no means um solved or uh, by no means improved by her death it's just a continuation of this complicated relationship i think it's improved (laughs) (laughs) well it's kind of like and what um, were your thoughts yeah what's okay this is i'm being a super noob right now what's the guy's name on lord of the ring and lord of the rings that tries to steal the ring from from frodo but sean bean dies right (laughs) Yeah, Ned Sean Stark, the the best martyr of them all. Spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> yeah, spoilers for a bunch of things right now. But it was very Boromir esque, right? Like, like she can't really improve the situation except for by kind of sacrificing herself, um, and that's kind of like the one way she can stop the situation yeah. from getting even worse. Um, and so that's the. But at least with Boromir's action, he was able to like save the hobbits or, and like let them escape. You know, like. Uh, her she just yeah. did nothing except maybe a bargain well, like a improved relations with the hesperians yeah exactly but that was like the thing that they needed though right because they needed the food they needed the supplies like, yeah that was kind of their it was inevitable of yeah mess yeah so i don't know it's yeah. kind of it was it was rough i think that the one thing i will say is it's going to be interesting to see i wish we could see how Naja writes her in history because by the end, that was a big theme and a big way that she looked at herself was 
I'm going to write myself. I'm going to write myself as the star of this show. And like, I'm going to write out everybody else. Nobody's even going to remember Najah's name. Nobody's even going to remember the trifecta. And so it'd be interesting to see yeah. how she gets remembered. I'd read that. I don't think she will be remembered fondly. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> but I think she, it's hard to say. I do wonder if it's more like, will she be remembered? Cause some of what she was focused on there, if I am remembering correctly, is this like, you could easily be someone who did all these like things that were huge impact on the world and almost be erased from history. And that's why she's like, mm-hmm. yeah, Neja, I can make it so no one even remembers who he is. It would just kind of wipe him off the face of the uh, of history. And I do wonder. I, I imagine she'd have to be remembered because of what she did to the mutinies. But yeah, I I mean, she can't be remembered fondly. She's going to be remembered probably like a war criminal, if anything. Because uh, how else, right? This is such a great idea that uh, that Kwong set up really well with the red emperor and his legacy and then the fact that uh the the spearly queen tirza i think was her name yeah. like wasn't in history at all but in reality she's like wait that's her and that that huge statue right there but she's not in anyone's history so again just like getting at this idea of the the unreliability of the historical narrative and the victors write the histories and uh, so many things were set up really well like this looking back at this series uh I really hope that RF Kwong gets the credit she deserves for putting together a really tightly uh, written and set up like not only were the was the prose really strong, but just the way that she presented ideas and developed them and asked questions like incredibly impressive for someone who is younger than all of us and already has three best selling <laughs> novels. Out right. there. Like I'm really excited to read more from her. <laughs> Very well Definitely. said. I think her her understanding of like at the high academic level of Chinese history really serviced the story really well. And I think, you know, I think I read an interview where she said, you know, she was writing the story that she's always wanted to read, you know, and you really get the sense that this is someone who has Mm. a very intimate understanding of these elements of Asian history, Chinese history, and, and understood these characters and like the, who would think to write, Mao and a perspective that we might almost sympathize and cry over, you know, it, it, it takes a really yeah. strong understanding of that to, to write w- what we just read in the burning God. And, that, and I think that makes Kwong like what makes this work just so impressive. And to go off of that, Charles, one thing that she has said is that she's really dissatisfied with novels that at the end of the rebellion or revolution, everything is just kind of happy. Like it's like, Oh, who married right. who? And they had these kids and like the, the nations are now all at peace. And she's like, no, that's not how it ever (laughs) works in reality. And that's really frustrating. Right. She gave the example of Lord of the Rings as a really good example. Actually the books, not the movie. Like when they go back to the Shire and the Shire is all overtaken by the people that live there. It's like, yeah, that might be really how things would have happened. Like in this power vacuum Uh, that didn't make it into the movies, unfortunately, but uh, the scouring of the Shire, which is right at the end of the... Yeah, Dylan missed all those ruffians. (laughs) I feel like that's that's cool because she like... I won't comment on that. I feel like it's cool because she contrasts it with... Go ahead, Kind of their drunken nights, kind of theorizing what they would do if they could, you know, like, oh, we would, you know, make it like end a child marriage. And like, so it, it was kind of like, she put that those concepts out there as being these like total unrealistic pipe dreams that, that they were kind of talking about. And all of us are like, no, just, you can do that. Like, let's go, you know? So um, I don't know. I, I, it's cool hearing yeah. that. It's also nice then, to like, see them being kids still. Cause it. they're so young. Yeah. Those were very, yeah, fun that's a great point, Ben. I think it's super interesting to see them in those positions of leadership now where it's like, yeah, you might be, like there she's like 21 by the end of this thing so yeah. she's basically like how old at least like i was in my like junior senior year of college i was not really ready to run a country um but, really? but either <laughs> no not yet uh you know, you know now took a few more maybe, years no. yeah a few more years charles maybe uh you you steven maybe and ben 
I believe in you too, but not me. But I, I'll say that that's the situation that they're in where they can just burn everything down. They had that kind of power to do the destroying, but then it's like, well, what are you going to do now? What's your tax plan here? And Mm -hmm. there's not one. How are you going to feed everyone? There's not one. And it's more of these like idealistic things. And I think the, they're, they're interesting, especially Rin's because the whole thing started with her being a potential victim of child marriage like being married off to uh, this guy mm-hmm. when she didn't want to so i think it, it does speak to those bits about rin where it's like i was powerless because of this so i'll get rid of the thing now that i have power uh, i like that about her character yeah. in the position but she doesn't have a logistical plan she's not like like steven and charles over there who uh, <laughs> run all the behind the scenes <laughs> schedule like uh, it's it's a tough sitch you guys just need to play a few more games of Civilization, and then you'll be ready to, you know. <laughs> I see you're all about that these days. <laughs> that yeah, was on your yeah, like really... six things you like, right? Um... Yeah, I've been been playing too much Civ Six lately. Uh, so there's been a few times in this recording where I've just had really strong Hamilton vibes. The play, right? Oh yeah, uh, like w- when they're trying to get their their tax plan, their debt plan through, and everything. Uh, in your in the most recent thing you said there, Dylan. But uh, I think we need a musical version of the Poppy Wolf. <laughs> it would be so depressing. <laughs> oh. It would be almost but like it could be so tragic. I, Honestly, I think this is this idea has legs. Maybe so. Uh, if if you're listening, uh, Rebecca Kwong, please uh, please let us know if you've sold the musical rights yet, because I will see that. She sold oh, the video figure. rights, the film rights. Nice. But yeah, uh, I don't know if that included the Maybe musical package. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, Steven. I don't know what you're imagining this playing out. I'd be, I would watch it, but <laughs> singing? <laughs> there, well, come on. There's not, there wasn't singing in Victor Hugo's Les Mis, but uh, they just added that in. It feels very natural. <laughs> I can I see believe... Nesha being a fantastic singer. Mm. I, yeah, probably. Yeah. He's got a nice. I mean, he has he's, the, he's got a nice like Javert the the bass. Going on. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. that's true. He does. That's true. Yeah. That's a good call. It is very dramatic. I, you know, right. it's almost Shakespearean at the end, where it's like she stabs herself in Neja's arms. You know, like I mean, come on, that's exactly yeah. In the heart, that's theater in the material. Heart. In the heart, it's, it's like, like oh, she had the resolve for both of them. You know, it's very. Right. This is made for dramatic. theater. Yeah, it's well, very. I do get that. I get the Hamilton vibes, Stephen. I do because uh-huh, I mean, uh-huh. in both ways, I would say it's their like relentlessness and their pursuit of their goals. Uh, Hamilton and I would say I'm spoiling Hamilton, but it's based on history, and I don't think you can spoil history. Um, so <laughs> nah. I'm going to just it's go for it. Yeah, you know that guy Hamilton who really existed did get shot in a duel um, and died, and. <laughs> It's a uh, a tragic ending that's brought about by his own relentless pursuit of his goals, and I would say that's what we get from Rin is a tragic ending because of her own relentless pursuit of her goals and power, of course. And, yeah. All right, I'm going full Lin Manuel here. We're going to write the adaptation, we and then we will work out the rights as as we go. But it's going to be fantastic. Well, he's got work on King Killer first. <laughs> He's got the king killer rights. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a touchy subject. <laughs> Whoa. We'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, th- thanks for bearing with us. Get a hat on. <laughs> Please don't let him. Yeah, do if that. you wanna, if you <laughs> cut it, if cut you wanna mic. hop on Pentology Discord and talk with Dylan, his uh, his his candle there is Defender of Dennis. So, I, th- I think we know what that means. <laughs> definitely find me in that uh in the king killer spoiler section <laughs> <laughs> well, i think this is the point of the podcast where we've just wrapped up into hysterics so I'm, I'm gonna call it thanks so much for uh listening to the end of the poppy war the burning god i uh, i guess rebecca kwong is now finishing what she's calling her oxford novel yeah. more of like a, a period piece i'm not certain if there's a there's a fantasy element to it or not i think that would be a fantastic story i'll probably read it either way because i just think she's a great author and i'm, I'm down to support her she's through incredible. the rest of her career mm-hmm. so thanks for sticking with us and uh, thanks so much 
Charles and Dylan from Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. Steve you can find Dan. them everywhere, especially on Twitter. They've got some uh, GIFs out Ooh. there. Wow. Yeah. I have GIFs. They have GIFs. <laughs> if you want to hear, uh, hear more from Phantology, you can find us at www.phantologybooks.com. And you can support the show at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. So until next time, see you guys later. Bye, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Phantology. If you'd like to let us know your opinions on all things sci-fi and fantasy, join our Discord. Invites are in the episode descriptions below. If you'd like to support the show, like these fine folks here, you can do that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. Patrons get early access to new episodes, exclusive postings, and exclusive Discord benefits. But of course, just listening and watching and sharing with your friends and family is support enough. Journey before destination all. 